Well Read Books is proud to announce the release of an important new title, The Revolutionary Legacy of Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg has often been misrepresented as an opponent of the October Revolution, standing for some sort of softer, anti-authoritarian Marxism as against that of Lenin and the Bolsheviks. In this book, Marie Fredrickson sets the record straight. Examining her ideas on the basis of what she actually wrote, the book reclaims Rosa Luxemburg as the revolutionary she was. You can order the book now from our website, wellreadbooks.net, for only 12 99 and you can get free shipping till the end of March with the code ROSA1871. Hello comrades and welcome back to Marxist Voice, the podcast of Socialist Appeal. There are only days to go until the second round of the French presidential elections, in which French voters will face the choice between two bourgeois candidates, Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. Earlier this week we spoke to Joe Attard, a writer and activist for the international Marxist tendency, discussing questions like why it is that two bourgeois candidates were able to get through to the second round, why the left-wing candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon failed to succeed, and what attitude those on the left should take towards the second round of the French elections. Should we support Macron against Le Pen as part of a Republican front, or should we stand for an independent class position? All of these questions and more will be discussed in this episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by Socialist Appeal. So today we're joined by Joe Attard. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Joe? Sure. Um, I'm a writer, an activist for the International Marxist Tendency, and I work for Marxist.com, which is the main international website for the IMT. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so yeah, first of all, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, and, and, and yeah, we'll just jump straight into some questions in that case. So the last round of the elections has seen two bourgeois candidates get through to the second round. Yet, in your recent article for Marxist.com, you said that these results represent a rejection of the establishment. Uh, Why would you say that is? Well, the first thing to say is, superficially, we're in the same position that we were in 2017. You've got a runoff between Emmanuel Macron, who is the incumbent president, his party, Republic en Marche, uh, calls itself centrist, but we've seen over the last few years, it's pretty um, radical in its treatment of striking workers, protesting young people. It viciously oversaw the repression of the Gilets jaunes movement, which was a protest that initially began against a hike in uh, fuel prices, but exploded into a near insurrectionary movement that expressed the justifiable anger at Macron's government of the rich and it was put down with extreme police brutality. Dozens of young people in particular who were leading these protests ended up with their fingers blown off, their eyeballs blown out by um, the weapons of the of the riot police. And the courts were turned into these revolving doors, basically, to send protesters straight to prison. Uh, and then there was the repression of the strike movement in 2019 uh, that was led primarily by... Um, unionized rail workers with the CGT, but again, expanded well beyond that. Um, it was in response to attacks on pensions and privatizations of the state and so on. Um, and on the other hand, you have Marine Le Pen, who heads up um, National Rally, which is the rebranded Front National. Again, an absolutely clear enemy of our class, um, a party with a long history of racism, Islamophobia, uh, anti-migrant policy. And this was the runoff that you had in 2017. You had in second round, Macron versus Le Pen. And this time you've ended up with the same thing. However, the outcome, which put Macron on top with about 27% of the votes and Le Pen with about 23, it masks the reality because the point is so-called extremist candidates got over 50% of the vote. And that goes for so-called extremists of the right and of the left. So on the one hand, you had Le Pen with 23%. She's regarded by by many in France and internationally as on the extreme right. You know, her father was was, actually was a fascist. Mm. Um, That is the political lineage of, of Front National. Although I don't think that Marine Le Pen is a, is a fascist, and we'll get into that later, perhaps. Mm. 
because that's very important in terms of determining our policy and the attitude of the French left going forward. Uh, but nevertheless, regarded as an extreme candidate, um, you had another guy called Zamor who came fourth um, with about 7% of the votes, who basically stated himself on the right of Le Pen with what you might call a classic throwback Front National, <laughs> just openly racist, uh, anti-migrant, um, viciously chauvinistic platform. But then on the left, you also had Jean-Luc Mélenchon of Rebellious France, Front en Semise, increasing his vote share from the first round in 2017, coming within 1% of Le Pen. And beyond that, you also had you know, a small showing by the Communist Party and a handful of small left parties. The point is, if you aggregate it all, what you end up with is a clear lack of enthusiasm for the establishment candidates and an increase of support for either the extremists or, you could say, just as importantly, none of the above, because 26% of the French electorate didn't vote at all. So really, if you dig under the surface, what you see is a profound rejection of the status quo. And the point that I would make is that the strong showing for Mélenchon, who was regarded as the far left candidate, he was certainly the only serious left candidate, the only candidate that was recognized as presenting a left alternative to Macron or Le Pen, um, did far better than expected. Um, Le Pen, obviously, came pretty close to Macron. Beyond that, um, plenty of French people didn't feel that any of the candidates represented a way forward. So uh, Macron, despite coming first, really he has reaped the consequences of his reactionary policies of the last several years. Um, a term of the sensible centre ground has taught the French that actually uh, it's... Um, it's no real alternative. It offers no way forward. As a matter of fact, I don't think very many French people were particularly uh, impressed with Macron even the first time round, although all of the bourgeois press in France and internationally sung his praises. He was meant to be the, the great white hope of the sensible uh, liberal centre ground against the so-called populists, which, as we know, is just a term the bourgeois use for any candidate they don't like. Um, but his authority has completely collapsed. Um, his, he has no organic support whatsoever, I would say. He has a bit of a base amongst the most conservative layers of society, and I don't mean that in terms of the most far right. I mean the people who are gripping desperately onto some kind of sense of status quo. Um, and, and he's thoroughly discredited. I'd say that he's widely hated in French society, as a matter of fact. So that's why I say that really the m biggest takeaway from this first round is it dealt a stunning blow to the establishment. And the last thing to point out in that regard is the complete demolition of the traditional parties. And this is a tendency that had already been developing. You saw it in 2017 as well. But um, the Republicans, the traditional center-right party, and their candidate Procress, got 4.8%. Now, in the French elections, if you don't make 5%, you can't claim back your campaigning <laughs> costs. And it's brought the Republicans, you know, this is the this is the party of Chirac, this is the party of the Gaul. It's brought them to the point of bankruptcy. And their candidate, Pecresse, had to make this embarrassing plea to her supporters to send in donations via her website <laughs> in order to cover the campaigning costs that she's now lost. Mm. Uh, obviously, I won't shed many tears for her or for her party, but, but there you are. But uh, even more dramatic was the drubbing that the uh, Socialist Party received. They got 1.7% of the vote, which is really stunning. Um, and again, this is a continuation of what we saw in the last election. They already had to sell their HQ, their plush HQ in Paris, in order to get some funds in to plug the gap in their finances after they got hammered in the, in the last elections. And this result is, is, is even worse. Um, they've been reduced to a near irrelevance on the electoral map. Um, you know, their candidate, Hildago, um, was the uh, mayor of Paris, and she did terribly. Um, so you have the two dominant parties of the post-war electoral landscape in France utterly destroyed uh, in these elections. And that really is a demonstration of 
both parties failing to manage the crisis of French capitalism, foisting the consequences of that crisis onto the shoulders of the working class, and being um, served just desserts as, as a consequence. So that's another uh, bit of evidence for the rejection of the status quo, the rejection of the establishment in these elections. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, moving on to a, a candidate and, and also a party that I think have fared, you know, slightly better than the traditional parties, I'd like to talk about uh, Mélenchon in particular. Uh, now, obviously, he failed to secure a place in the second round, although, to be fair, he was only within a couple of percentage points uh, of beating uh, Le Pen. Yeah, what were the reasons for uh, yeah, Mélenchon and France Insoumise's failure uh, to, 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 yeah, to, to win over Le Pen? Because um, it was a real possibility. Yeah. Well, the first thing we should say is he was within 1%. He was within about 500,000 votes mm. of beating Le Pen. Um, it was an absolute hair's breadth away from a Macron versus Mélenchon second round, which of course would have electrified the situation because it meant the French people, the French masses, would have had a choice. They would have had a clear choice between an out-and-out right-winger in Macron and a left-winger in the form of, of Mélenchon. That would have completely changed the situation. It would have surely resulted in quite a lot of those non-voters being presented with an alternative, perhaps giving their support to Mélenchon. Um, it would have pushed Mélenchon's support base um, to, to a fever pitch. It would have seen a massive radicalization of the situation. We'd be having a very different conversation right now. Um, and it's much closer, in fact, than Mélenchon got in 2017, where I think he got 19% of the vote. So that's the kind of margin we're talking about. I think there are two main reasons for why Mélenchon didn't quite make it. The first is down to him. Uh, Front on Samise has moved to a more, quote-unquote, you can't see my air quotes, but a quote-unquote <laughs> sensible position. It's moved to the centre, um, closer to the centre since 2017. It's moderated its position. Um, which has cost its support. I mean, this isn't a period in French politics. As I say, you had the Gilets jaunes followed by the big strike wave. But aside from that, you've also had big protests against giving more powers to the police to increase surveillance, um, young people protesting hijab bans, um, you know, anti-racist protests, protests against police brutality. It's been a period of intensifying class struggle in France. I would say uninterrupted, really, intensifying mm. class struggle. And that's, you know, not even including the pandemic, which added another dimension to the situation, intensified and exacerbated the social and economic crisis even more. And in that context, if François Samise had moved further to the left, had radicalized even further and made a clear and unambiguous attack on capitalism and all of its institutions, I think that it would have had a much better chance of getting over the line. I think it would have preserved more of its support, because this is the thing we should say. Front on Samise was trailing at a good 15% behind um, Macron for most of this race. It was only really in the last uh, couple of weeks that it started to accelerate um, in its support towards the final days where it became a very close-run thing. Um, so I think that at least part of the blame should fall on, on Mélenchon um, for, for moderating his message rather than embracing the radical mood that exists amongst French workers and youth, the hunger for an alternative. Um, but I think the other reason, um, and, and it's the same reason um, that we and our French comrades were criticising in 2017, is down to the wrecking uh, and splitting behaviour of the small left parties. Actually, the biggest responsibility falls on the Communist Party, the PCF, who stood a candidate against Mélenchon, a um, guy called Roussel. Uh, they got 3% of the vote, which is pathetic. In, in, in of itself, it's, it's a meaningless result. They haven't even been able to claim back their campaign costs again. But it was more than enough to ensure that Mélenchon wasn't um, in the second round. It was more than enough to ensure that no matter what happens, on the 24th, the French people will have to choose between a right-winger and another right-winger. And you had this really disgusting display of the Communist Party initially refusing to support Mélenchon, and that overture was made. Mélenchon tried to seek the support of the, of the Communist Party, refusing to endorse Mélenchon, you know, saying that he couldn't win anyway, saying that he wasn't really left-wing, saying that he wasn't connected organically to the unions, this sort of thing. 
uh, and then after the first round, immediately coming out to endorse Macron in order to <laughs> defeat the fascists, as they put it. So you have the unedifying display of a so-called communist party endorsing a banker. Um, having said it was impossible for a left winger to get to the second round and ensuring that happened by standing. So I think that the greatest shame, the deepest shame should fall on the shoulders of the tops of the Communist Party. And they've secured a huge amount of anger from their traditional support base for what is, in my opinion, uh, an open betrayal of the French working class. Um, and of course, you've had a number of other small parties, um, you know, parties like the uh, the MPA, parties like Workers Struggle, um, who gained you know one or two percentage points between them. Um, the Greens as well um, stood a candidate who, at one stage, was Jadot, who at one stage was hyped up um, as being a potential contender, but ended up, I think, getting about five percent of the vote or so. So again, not particularly impressive. The Greens are not especially left-wing as a party. I mean, they're much closer to, to Macron in their leadership, uh, openly pro-capitalist. Um, but they have a section of their support base that is drawn to um, you know, the, the fight against the cl- climate crisis, who could lean left, who were drawn in, actually, by the strong... Um, anti-climate change components of Melanchon's program, who could have made all the difference. But again, they're a right-wing party, in my opinion, or a, you know, a liberal party. But yes, um, the, the splitting role of the small parties, and in particular the role of the Communist Party in standing a candidate against Melanchon, coupled with Melanchon's own mistakes, I think, are the reasons that they didn't make the second round. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I agree. It's uh, completely indefensible behaviour um, from those other parties. And uh, you mentioned as well that the uh, the the Communist Party uh, leader has now, you know, uh, miraculously sort of backed uh, Macron after you know refusing to back uh, Mélenchon. But you know, as with the the, the previous uh, presidential elections back in 2017, I believe, you know, we we also which, which was also between uh, Macron and uh, Le Pen as well. Um, you know, we saw a whole host of left leaders and, and pundits and so on, uh, including our very dear friend Paul Mason here in Britain as well, you know, call on workers and, and call on the public in general to, to vote for Macron as this uh, so-called lesser evil. And I think, you know, we can expect to see exactly the same thing this time around. We've already saw it from the Communist Party leader. You know, people are calling for this uh, Republican front, I believe they're calling it. Mm-hmm. And even Melanchon himself has already strongly implied at least that voters uh, should should back Macron, stopping short of, a, of an explicit endorsement at least. Um, so yeah, why is this idea of, of, of uh, Macron as a lesser evil a mistake? And, and will things be different this time around? Well, the first thing we need to make very clear is that Marine Le Pen is a lot of things. Um, she's a brute, she's a reactionary, she's a class enemy, she's a liar and a demagogue, but she's not a fascist. In fact, the, the very fact that Zemmour felt the need to stand in order to provide a real, true blue, Front National, just full-on racist, chauvinist candidate was in response to the fact that Marine Le Pen has quite cleverly shifted her program, mm. shifted her rhetoric quite considerably. She's toned down the, the racism, although there are still plenty of reactionary anti-migrants and nationalist policies in her program, um, but she's toned down that side of her rhetoric to a considerable degree. And what is she talking about? She's talking about the cost of living crisis. She's talking about fuel subsidies. She's talking about easing the pressure on the poor, the working class, and the lower middle class. She's talking about state incentives for bosses and business owners to increase wages. She's basically uh, taken an anti-Macron, anti-establishment position, which demagogically attempts to draw on the genuine anxieties of the French people in the teeth of a massive cost of living crisis. And, you know, following a long period of uh, capitalist crisis more generally. Um, So really, in a distorted way, the support for Le Pen from a lot of people in France expresses the same process as the support for Mélenchon. It's a desire for an alternative. It's a reaction against the um, the rotten status quo and Macron's government of the rich. But it's, uh, it, it, it's a common trick, and we saw it last time, this attempt by the bourgeois to basically threaten and bully the left, threaten and bully 
Mel Shan supporters, the workers and youth into supporting the sensible, reliable, um, respectable capitalist candidate against the um, the against against Front National or National Rally, I should say. They did the exact same thing last time, uh, and the reformists do this as well. And we we have to be very clear that even more so than in 2017, the French workers and youth have had a dose of what the sensible, lesser evil candidate means. It means brutal attacks on the French working class. It means brutal attacks on young people, brutal attacks on migrants. We should say as well, Macron has leaned hard into chauvinism. I mean, he's been the one talking about uh, Islamo-leftism. He's been the one that's been pushing uh, attacks on Muslims. He's the one that's been whipping up um, you know, anti-migrant hysteria, basically because he's trying to take a chunk of Le Pen support base in order to shore up his diminishing base of support. Um, so it, it, it's even more clear compared to last time that there isn't any fundamental difference between these two candidates. They're both reactionary, bourgeois, pro-capitalist candidates. Uh, and it's not just a question as well of the, you know, the uh, slide into more and more national chauvinism. It's not just a case of the vicious state repression that Macron's overseen. His program over the last several years um, has involved relentless attacks on the working class. It's seen privatizations, huge privatizations of the states, you know, big sackings, public sector workers, attacks on pensions. And also uh, pro-rich policies, you know, tax breaks for big companies, liberalizing French labor laws. Um, you know, Macron has been uh, a clear enemy of the French working class ever since he was elected. So even more so than in 2017, I think that this um, attempt to frighten people into backing Macron as lesser evil will be unconvincing because Macron's now tested. Everyone knows what Macron means, and he's hated. Um, Le Pen actually isn't tested. Le Pen's never been in power, which is part of the reason that lots of frustrated people, you know, people from the working class departments in the north, um, in, in rural, deindustrialized France as well, people who in the past might have supported the Communist Party are willing to take a punt on Le Pen because at least she's, you know, a, a, an unknown entity. At least she's. Um, an alternative, and you know, in a distorted way, that's a reflection of the experience of the of the of the, of the last few years under Macron. So I think that it's very important that the French left reject any attempt to be bullied into getting behind Macron, into collaborating with the class enemy in order to stop so-called fascism, which in reality is just another bourgeois right-wing politician, because it's very important for the battles to come, for the French left to maintain a clean banner, because the battles to come are going to dwarf what we've seen in the past, because no matter what the outcome on the 24th, you're going to see such an intensification of an already explosive situation. Uh, not only have none of the social and economic crises that gave rise to the Gilets jaunes and the big strike movements in the last few years been resolved, they're going to get far worse with the increasing cost of living crisis, the pressure of the war in Ukraine, the global economic crisis. It's going to be a real tinderbox in France, and there's going to be class struggle um, such as we've never seen before. And in that context, it's very important that the French left keep its hands clean, keep its banners clean, maintain class independence so it can be an earnest and genuine ally to the working class in struggle, who we should say will be fighting, um, whether it's against Le Pen or Macron, against the representatives of capitalism. And what the reformists are saying, what the likes of idiots such as Paul Mason <laughs> are suggesting, is to form an alliance of convenience with the exact same pro-capitalist candidates that are the source of all the anger we're seeing in French society. It would be a disastrous mistake for the uh, for the French left to endorse that position. And we should have the exact same attitude internationally. We cannot touch class collaboration especially given the intense struggles we're going to see in the next period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. 
Uh, and you mentioned that class struggle is, is only going to intensify, and I completely agree with that as well. Um, but it seems to me that you know the working class, at least for now, are blocked on the political front. Perhaps you may disagree. I don't know what uh, significance the legislative elections hold, for example. Maybe you want to touch on that. But I, I want to hear, you know, how, how is this, uh, this, this class anger uh, and how is this class struggle going to be expressed if, it, if the class is block, blocked on the political front? Uh, I know, for example, that they have... Um, even just in the past week, there have been you know, quite large demonstrations of, of, of the youth, for example, um, you know, a, 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 against these uh, the, these election results and against this sort of false choice, basically between you know Macron and, and Le Pen. So uh, yeah, maybe you could talk a bit more about you know what lies ahead, basically, for French politics in, in the coming period. Yes, well, you're absolutely right. We're beginning to see the first tremors of the struggles to come, and unsurprisingly, it's starting with the youth. I mean, Mélenchon. Uh, had the biggest cross section of support amongst the youth, um, which which is unsurprising. Um, and just last week, you had big occupations of a number of universities, and particularly um, Sorbonne University in Paris, which of course was a historic staging ground for mm-hmm. the um, revolutionary general strike in May '68. Mm-hmm. Uh, about somewhere between uh, 800 and 1,000 students took over the amphitheatre and occupied the university for 30 hours before they were viciously evicted by the police. And their slogan was neither one nor the other, neither Macron nor Le Pen. Mm. And this really goes to show what I've been saying. The French people, and particularly um, the French youth, have had a belly full of Macron, and they are seeing through the demagogy. They understand that there's no fundamental difference between Macron and Le Pen, and their mood is for neither one nor the other. And that's um, the same slogan that our (laughs) French comrades of Revolution are, are using I understand their paper was selling like gangbusters at uh, these big yeah. demonstrations. Foresight over astonishment. Foresight <laughs> over astonishment. Uh, I, wish, I wish I knew that expression in French. I'd sound very clever. But um, <laughs> there were also street protests on the weekend, um, ostensibly anti-fascist protests or anti-far-right protests. And again, although the demonstration was organised ostensibly to oppose Le Pen, the mood was for neither one nor the other. And... Um, this is why I say that no matter what the outcome, you're going to see an explosion of class struggle because Macron is hated and Le Pen also by uh, a, a huge cross section of workers and youth is identified as a class enemy. I mean, OK, a, a certain section are, are, are willing to take a gamble on Le Pen in the same way that a section of the American working class is willing to take a gamble on Trump because of all the years of lip service they've been paid by the Democrats and their frustration with the status quo, their desire to give the establishment a shake. But plenty of workers and youth understand that Le Pen is, is, a, is a class enemy. So no matter who wins, there's going to be struggle. And no matter who wins, either candidate ultimately will have to carry out the tasks of capitalism. They're going to have to carry out attacks on the workers and youth in order to save capitalism, to preserve the boss's profits in the period of crisis uh, that we are living through. During the cost of living crisis, you know, with inflation skyrocketing, they're going to have to attack the uh, terms and conditions, the living standards of workers and youth. They're going to have to carry on privatizing. They're going to have to carry on attacking trade union rights. So no matter what way they turn, the French ruling class will incur class struggle. Uh, and, and you're already starting to see it. So there were big demonstrations, not just in Paris. I believe there are about 20,000 people on the streets in the Paris area over the weekend. But you also had demonstrations in Marseille, um, in, in Lyon, uh, in Nancy, and other places as well. So you're starting to see the, uh, the early warning signs of what's to come. Um, and with regards to the legislative elections, I mean, it, it's, it's, it is important and it could be a rallying point and it'll be an important test as well for the forces of France en uh, You know, it, it is very possible that France uh, en Somise could do well in the legislative elections. And that, of course, will be a boost of morale to, um, to, the, to the movement. And it, I think it's all the more important in that case that at the very least, the ranks of France en Somise don't give in to the mood of class collaborationism being imposed on them by the establishment, being imposed on them by the reformists, and even unfortunately by Mélenchon, who, as you say, you know, stopped short of actually endorsing Macron, but said we can give no vote to 
the pen, which is fair enough, but then went on to say that what we are dealing with is two evils, but one evil is different from the other, and we cannot give any support to the greater evil. So essentially saying we have to vote for the lesser evil without saying we have to vote for the lesser evil. And the, the rank and file of front on Samis should resist that drift. They should strive for class independence so that perhaps using the results of the legislative elections you know, as a, as a rallying point, they can continue to, to maintain their confidence and maintain their integrity and continue to be a uh, political presence fighting alongside the working class in the battles to come. Yeah, okay, so I guess, uh, finally, what would you say are the, the tasks of, of, of socialists in, in France right now? Mm. Well, the first thing I would say um, jumps off from the last point that I made. If you look at a heat map of the first round of the French elections, you'll see that the departments where Mélenchon did well um, are principally the suburbs of the major cities. And that's very significant because that's where the working class lives. It's where migrant communities live um, and also did very well in cities and uh, and towns with big student populations. And that means two things. First of all, it means that France en Samise has basically replaced the old constituency of the Communist Party. It's become recognised at this stage as the main rallying point for workers, uh, migrants and young people, for the progressive layers of French society. And um, that, in my opinion, puts paid to the pessimistic nonsense from reformist commentators in France and internationally that the French left is dead. I mean, it really blew my mind when the BBC, I'm not saying the BBC are even remotely left, but as an establishment mouthpiece, it was amazing during the elections that given that Mélenchon was so close to entering the second round, he was barely mentioned. I went back through the coverage and there was some mention of far left candidates. (laughs) Uh, imagine if you got to the second round, it would have been really embarrassing. Oh, and also this guy we didn't mention is actually going to be taking on Macron in round two. Uh, it puts paid to the nonsense that we hear that the French left is dead. On the contrary, the conditions for a fighting left leadership with class struggle methods, a genuine alternative, have never been more favourable in France. There's a huge desire for an alternative. As I said, it's only because of the concessions by Mélenchon himself and also the wrecking behaviour of the um, the small left parties in the Communist Party that we haven't got a straight-up left versus right battle uh, in the second round. So the tasks of the French left should be defined by that mood, that mood of rejection of the establishment, of rejection, ultimately, of capitalism. You know, the consciousness of the working class um, always uh, has a lag when it comes to the level of radical change needed to, to, you know, to, to transform society for their interests. But nevertheless, what you have is a clear mandate for a rejection of the status quo. And the French left and the Marxists in, in, in France must be aware of that and they must tap into and connect with that mood. And that means you can't give an inch of ground to these calls for supporting one over the other, of supporting lesser evilism. It means that you have to maintain an absolutely independent class position. Um, and it means that uh, we can afford to be bold. We have to be radical and we have to be confident. We have to articulate a, uh, a genuine transformative program. We have to put forward an unashamedly socialist program. You know, these, these big assemblies that are being thrown up by students, this is only the beginning. We're going to see that in colleges and universities all over the country. We're going to see big strike movements. We're going to see big street protests. I firmly believe the next few years we'll see movements, we'll see strikes, we'll see protests that will dwarf even the Gilets jaunes, which reached near insurrectionary proportions. And in that context, if the French left, uh, if, the, if, the, if the leaders of the French left uh, can put forward a radical program of class struggle, then that will connect with the mood. And the Marxists in France have to put forward a program to transform society, root and stem. They have to say, ultimately, the reason that we've ended up with two rotten candidates is because the system itself is rotten. And what we need is to tear it all down 
and replace it with a society managed in the interest of the working class. Um, a society where nobody will have to choose between, you know, driving from the suburbs to work um, or, or heating their home because of the cost of petrol. No one will have to uh, think twice about whether they can have two meals or three. No one will have to think twice about uh, whether they can afford to eat or feed their kids because that's the reality for millions of French people, just as it's the reality for millions of people in, in Britain, in this country, and, and all around the world. And that mood and that reality will intensify. So in that context, I think that uh, the, the revolutionary ideas of Marxism will find a bigger echo than they ever have, particularly amongst young people. So I'd say that the task for the French left at large is class independence and radical class struggle methods and an uncompromising program of, of combating whichever reactionary happens to lead the country. And for the Marxist, it's putting forward a bold socialist program to transform society absolutely, to tear down French capitalism and replace it with socialism, uh, and to connect in particular with the young people who are going to be coming to the fore. Because this is the thing, you know, France is a country with a, a legacy of insurrection, with traditions of insurrection. And I think that when you combine those traditions with the magnitude of the current crisis, there are really, there's really no limits to how much our ideas, the ideas of Marxism, can connect with the French workers and youth. So those, I would say, are the tasks of the day. Yeah, so we'll leave it there today. Uh, thanks very much for coming on the podcast, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in to this week's episode. Just before you go, I'd like to remind you that if you want to keep up to date with the events as they unfold in France, we are posting regular news and analysis from a Marxist perspective on Marxist.com. So check that out. The link will be in the show notes as always. And if you agree with what Joe has just said about the need for Marxist leadership and the need to reject class collaborationism in favour of an independent class position, then I would seriously urge any of our French listeners to get involved with Revolution, the, uh, the French section of the International Marxist Tendency. Uh, their website is marxiste.org and the link will be in the show notes. Um, but indeed, anywhere you are, whether it's in Britain, Canada, uh, Pakistan or elsewhere, the need for Marxist leadership has never been greater. We'll leave it there for this week. Uh, make sure you stay tuned. We've got some great episodes lined up on topics like the fall of Afghanistan and the imperialist meddling that has taken place there. And also the Marxist view of morality as well, a very important philosophical question. So thanks very much for listening once again. And we'll see you next week for the next episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by Socialist Appeal.